All right, it's 10 a.m. Pacific, let's uh, get going. So welcome everybody. There will surely be a few more uh, uh, people joining up shortly here, but uh, welcome to our 15th uh, webinar in our series. Uh, this one's on the tips and tricks for actuator selection and servicing. Uh, it's co-hosted by uh, CGIS, obviously, and uh, our uh, partners, uh, FlowServe uh, Limitorx. So uh, next slide, we'll get going. Um, there's a, again, like I said, there's a poll on, uh, on the screen there. If you can see it, if I uh, got to leave it off for a couple uh, more slides here, if feel free to answer that. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. Obviously, we uh, feel free to ask questions throughout the, the presentation. Um, everybody's muted, but there's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, we'll be monitoring that. Uh, if the question is pertinent to the slides, we'll, uh, we'll um, answer it. Uh, we'll try to get it answered right away. Otherwise, we'll uh, loop back at the end of the presentation and get that answered. Um, for uh, it's great to see we've got uh, um, continue to get more and more people signed up for our webinars. I think 150 people signed up for uh, this one today. Uh, it's great to see that we uh, we really enjoy sharing our knowledge um, and uh, and continue to uh, provide new ways of uh, innovating in uh, in uh, this changing changing environment. It's great to see the uh, the support that uh, we're getting with these webinars. So thanks for uh, for joining. Uh, a little bit about CJS for those that. Um, uh, haven't been to one of these before. Uh, we've, uh, we're now in our 42nd year, we started in 1980, uh, trusted valve and automation partner. Uh, we have uh, facilities across Canada, Australia, uh, and South America, um, and really try to differentiate ourselves by being the leader in uh, providing intelligent solutions when it comes to valve and actuation, uh, and really focusing on, again, the severe critical services for our, for, uh, for our customers. Uh, one of the things that we really try to differentiate ourselves with is, is again, understand that there are different needs for our customers. Um, our Streamline Solutions Group is fantastic at providing uh, that uh, that uh, replacement MRO type business that uh, the valve or the actuators worked well. Um, but we recognize that valves aren't just commodities and that they need to be looked at uh, um, in a different light often, especially again, all those critical and severe services. Um, as a result, we've put in two streams that uh, really focus on that. And one being the engineering solution stream, which uh, again, a bit more consultative, understanding what the application requires, uh, understanding um, either what your valve or your actuator needs to do uh, and providing the best solution to give you the longest life of uh, service. Um, the service solutions group, again, obviously providing that repair and uh, um, refurbishment uh, service, but also where we differentiate is really using that service group to understand um, what may be going uh, wrong with the product so that we can feed that information back to our engineering solutions group to give you longer life in service. Um, we look at uh, providing, uh, again, longevity in, in our products and uh, the product we're presenting on today, Limitorc, is, uh, is one that um, really fits that bill nicely. It's uh, a product that uh, is not uh, designed to be purchased and replaced uh, uh, quickly. It's one that has uh, it's designed for longevity, and, uh, but to, to meet that longevity, we need to understand a number of aspects about the application, and that's what we're talking about today. So uh, to take us through the presentation, we've got uh, two experts, one within CGIS as well as and uh, one from uh, FlowServe. Uh, Rob Cooper uh, with CGIS uh, has been, um, uh, he's got 21 years in oil and gas of customer service with experience in automation, natural gas engines and compressors. Uh, 15 years servicing end users directly with a focus on turnarounds and project planning uh, and is Limitorc Blue Ribbon certified. Uh, joining Rob Cooper today is uh, Dave Williams uh, from FlowServe Limitorc. Uh, Dave's got uh, 39 years of valve automation experience, um, 17 years as an EIM sales manager, and the last 22 years with Limitorc and Limitorc distribution. Uh, Dave's uh, the FlowServe Limitorc USA and Canada sales manager since 19, uh, sorry, since uh, 2014, and he's got a BA in business from the University. University of Lynchburg, Virginia. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Rob Cooper to take us through the next few slides. Thanks. Thanks, Brayden. Uh, again, just like to introduce myself, Rob Cooper with CGIS. I've been with CGIS for a couple of years now. Um, so I'll take you through the next few slides. Dave, you wanna to click to the next slide there, please? Dave, 
Oh, there we go. Thanks. So we're trying in TGIS, we're trying to really uh, put a footprint across Canada where we can have some service locations for full serve limit torque, um, as well as other products that we support. Uh, right now, Vancouver, Edmonton, and Montreal is where our service locations are. We have additional field offices. As you can see, we have Prince George, where we were founded, uh, Fort McMurray, Calgary, Saskatoon, Brampton, Hamilton, Ontario, St. John's, Sydney, and also we have a couple offices in New Zealand. Um, next slide, please. So in-house services, we cover all through authorized repair center, um, testing on non-destructive examinations, including hydrostatic electric pneumatic testing, uh, also included that is with the valve services that we do, uh, spare parts inventory program, design and drafting capabilities for all different kinds of solutions when we're discussing actuation. Field services, of course, just like, uh, you know, turnaround, shutdown, startup commissioning, calibrations, basic repairs, walkthroughs and preventative maintenance. Uh, we can run a preventative maintenance report for your assets at site, uh, where we can come up with a three-tier system of what's um, critical repair to something that doesn't need to be repaired at all. So the, the goal for this presentation, we really want everybody to understand the when you're dealing with putting an actuator on or replacing an actuator or using an existing actuator to a new valve, there's a lot of critical information that's needed that is uh, misconstrued throughout the industry. So we really want to, you guys to focus on uh, what Dave's going to explain here in the next uh, few slides. Uh, when you're understanding retro replacements, we're going to discuss a lot of information, valve torque data, brake to open, close, seating torques, run torque, safety factors, your, uh, if it's open, close, modulating, uh, any kind of obstructions that are near the actuator that we have to possibly be aware of. Um, next slide, please, Dave. When it comes to a rising stem actuator, Dave will be going through this. There's a lot of information that he's going to show you. Um, as you can see here, there's all that information, uh, stem OD, ID, how to get through all of this, take, take the measurements, the kind of thread, the thread pitch, because um, if we don't get this right, your actuator is not going to fit. Uh, next slide, please. When it comes to a quarter turn or a gearbox, there's also a bunch of information that is needed as well to make sure that we get the mounting of the actuator correct. Um, with the gearbox, we also need the, um, the gearbox ratio and the mechanical advantage. That way we can make sure that the actuation output um, combined with the gearbox isn't going to over torque your valve. Um, other things that we need is communication, power supply, local local feed, all that information as you're going to see through here where Dave's going to take you through the next bunch of slides. And if you have any questions, feel free to uh, type them in and we'll be answering them as we go along. So Dave, I'll leave it to you. Go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Rob and um, CGIS team. Again, my name is David Williams. I'm the sales manager for Close Serve Limitor based out of Lynchburg, Virginia. I'm uh, responsible for Canada and uh, USA. So um, today we'll talk about, as Rob said, uh, automating valves and uh, focusing a lot on, on retrofit, but whether it's a new valve or retrofit, the same principles and details are, are often required. Uh, no way I'm going to cover them all. I'm just trying to hit the highlights just as an educational purpose and to help show customers what we have to look at and consider. Let's keep in mind, every action what do we sell is designed for the valve it's on. Uh, we, we do have standards and custom features and things in our products that we can manipulate and adjust to meet requirements. But again, they're all configured and selected based on that individual valve's requirements. Again, that's what you buy an actuator for your valve uh, and not the next one beside it. So again, they may be different. Well, uh, Lumber Trucks produced lots of products over the years. Um, and our, our history is deep and long, but we still produce a lot of the products even from back in the 1960s. We'll talk about those a little bit today, but uh, we have, again, a variety of products. We have our SMB series products, which are our 1964 and later products, still very prevalent today in the uh, power and refining marketplace. Nuclear power is uh, 100, almost 100% limit torque in the U.S. and Canada these days, that are actually moving very heavily 100% limit torque in Canada, especially. Um, and uh, also 
also uh, water or buying S and B actuators because they've already lasted 50 years. We have our L120, which is a little lighter uh, frame actuator, more, co more compact and commercially priced electromechanical product. And then we have our electronic actuators, our MX and our QX series, uh, as well as a series of gearbox uh, gearboxes we could use for manual or motorized operations and torque extensions of our actuators. Again, uh, limit torque history goes back to the 1929-1930. This guy by the name of Payne Dean invented this uh, torque limiting machine, adapted it to a valve, and he called it limit torque. To our knowledge, that's the first valve actuator ever produced, and it was called limit torque. Of course, 1929 is kind of like uh, 2021 for us, a good time to start a business. Um, uh, it was challenging years. He ended up selling the product and the name to uh, Philadelphia Gearworks in, in Pennsylvania. And the Philadelphia Gearworks spun off the Limitor brand into its own corporation in the 1960s. Uh, and then uh, in the 1990s, uh, FlowServe acquired Limitor from uh, the Philadelphia Gear Corporation. So anyway, lots of history. Uh, uh, our longevity is, is our name. Uh, we have products in the field that were built in the 1940s uh, that are still in the field today and customers say, don't dare pull them out, put some new grease in them and put them back in service. Uh, that's, and that's our her heritage. So the first subject we're gonna, we're gonna talk about for us automating is, is one of the most common scenarios is gate and glow valves, uh, generally considered rising stems. When we're looking at a existing gate or even a new gate or globe valve, the certain information we need to know in order to uh, accommodate an actuator for it. Uh, we need to know the valve size, the stroke, length, the travel, uh, the maximum line size for the uh, pipeline, the differential pressure, the speed requirements. Uh, we also need to know the motor controls. So if someone's got to, if, we, if we're going to open and close a valve, the controls to open and close it have to either be in a control room or in the actuator and, and what type of requirements are, are there? What, what's the voltage? Uh, a lot of Canadian applications have 575. A lot of, in the States, it could be anywhere from you know, 110 volts to 460 volt AC. Uh, control wiring, um, how many wires are available in the conduit? Uh, and what kind of control wiring will you need to interface with the controls in your plant? Uh, do you want local controls on the actuators? Do you want to walk up to the actuator and open and close it or not? And do you need diagnostics? And, uh, historical data and, and current data from your valve and actuator for uh, maintenance purposes. We also need to record details uh, from, the, from the existing valve or from, the, or it's from its stem, uh, its adaptation flanges, any clearances or structures that may be in the way. And then we also need to make sure we can identify access to the valve. Uh, will we need a crane to put the actuator in or take off the existing actuator? Uh, will there be enough space to install the actuator? So lots of information we need, we need uh, in order to provide a package that will work for your application. Here's a picture of uh, some slab gates, pretty common on, pi on a pipeline. Uh, limit torque actuators with a gearbox uh, driven here. So when we operate a, a gate valve, as probably most of you already know, we utilize the same function as the hand wheel. Uh, a hand wheel on a gate valve normally turns a stem bushing, and then the acne screw threads on that valve stem versus the stem bushing, the rotary motion provides the linear thrust, the push-pull up and down motion of the valve, by turning that stem bushing. Likewise, when we motorize a gate valve, we put a stem bushing in our actuator that's generally threaded to match this valve stem. And then by providing the rotary motion we, uh, and torque, we support the thrust loads generated and provide the linear raising and lowering of that uh, gate valve and stem. There are some non-rising stem gate valves pretty commonly used in the uh, water and wastewater market uh, and other applications that are non-rising, but 
uh, for primary purposes, most applications uh, are rising stem gates, but we support applications that just do torque only or just turning the stem and the disc rods internally on the uh, valve stem. So here's an example of uh, an application where I worked on a few years ago where the uh, actually was a water plant, wastewater plant that had existing uh, a gate and they had a, a good gearbox on there that was ready to uh, easily automate it. But the only problem was that the clearance between this flange and this uh, frame of the valve was pretty tight. Uh, we looked at possibly removing the gearbox and putting the ash wire direct, but we ended up working in where, as you can see here, we direct mounted our actuator uh, to that bevel gear and drove it. If you if, look at the picture, you wouldn't see any, anything different than the standard, but the standard is we actually removed the hand wheel. There wasn't enough room there for a hand wheel. So we put a uh, drive nut on the hand wheel input and we have a hand wheel that will be going through this little guide uh, and extend the hand wheel out here to the side. So again, we made the actuator work in the application taking consideration of the clearances. Sometimes, and most commonly on gates, we have to go right back to the flange on the valve. If there isn't a flange on the valve, we'll have to make one sometimes, or there may be a flange like this on the existing valve. We would get the measurements of this flange and then we would adapt a uh, uh, transition plate for our actuator in case our actuator didn't already meet this bolt pattern. Most of our actuators follow a ISO or MSS bolt pattern configuration. However, most valves, especially on the gate valve side, uh, do not normally have ISO or MSS standard flanges. Uh, so we have to accommodate that. And then we would machine our bushing like this bushing shown here to uh, match these stems. So again, different adaptations required based on the current situation with the valve. One of the challenges of dealing with a gate valve is dealing with the acne screw shaft. The screw shaft on the valve uh, will be cut to a certain pitch and lead and diameter based on the valve criteria for the thrust loads, the torque, the speed of operation. And getting the detail on this valve stem is very important because basically since we're driving the valve, uh, turning a stem nut uh, to this, the stem and threads become basically a, a transfer of torque to thrust ratio, of, if you will, it's kind of like a gear train. Uh, and it, it has a huge impact on our conversion and calculation of torque requirements for the valve. This little chart here at the bottom shows some of the common thread configurations. So, and excuse me, but I, I talk inches, not metrics, but, um, so in, in inches, a very common stem is a four thread per inch, uh, we'll call a quarter pitch, quarter lead stem. In that case, I would have four threads over an inch. It would take me uh, four turns of my hand wheel or my actuator's output to move this gate one inch. Likewise, if I had a three thread per inch stem, I could move the gate uh, three turns and move it an inch. If the plant wants to operate it at 12 inches per minute, this unit would be 36 RPMs, and this one would be 48. It's possible this stem may have a double lead, which means I have two threads coming around in parallel. So my four thread per inch stem would actually travel uh, one inch with just two turns. So I'll only need a 24 RPM unit. So right there is 36, 24, and 48 RPM speeds to accommodate only difference in the valve would be the stem pitch and lead. So again, critical information. What you don't wanna do is when you machine your stem nut is have it fit poorly and end up with a result like this. Uh, this is an example of a stem nut that was cut, was cut too tight. We like a nice, loose, smooth running fit. Uh, and then uh, it got tried to get forced down and rather than uh, chasing the threads, as they called it, they bent the valve stem. Uh, measuring a valve stem, I, just, I took a piece of valve stem and just showed it here for examples. Uh, we, my, a lot of my distributors do this in the field or do it in, in their shops if they have the valve in house. First thing we have to look at is the valve outside diameter. And so we're here, we're measuring the outside diameter of the valve threads. 
We also have to look at the root uh, or the minor diameter of the stem, so inside the threads. Uh, I will say probably the most common error in cutting a stem stem nut is uh, is cutting the, uh, the the minor bore correctly. Um, then we have to measure the stem to see how many threads we have over an inch. If you see here, my caliper is on top of a thread. And then between my caliper, I actually have one, two, three threads, and I end up on top of another one, but the space between the calipers is three threads. So in this scenario, I have a, a one third uh, pitch. When I take my, if you can see this black cable and wrap around that screw shaft, I notice my cable starts here, it comes here and it comes there. So there's, the cable is, is, is transitioning to each uh, tooth on the stem. So that means I have a single lead stem. So that tells me I have a three threads per inch, single lead, which would be three turns per inch for that bow stem. Here's another stem, similar configuration, uh, that actually, if you notice the cable wrapped around, it skips uh, a thread every time around. This is a double lead stem. So what you have here, you have the strength and carrying force of, uh, of uh, four, uh, three threads, but you have the speed of one and a half threads. So again, this stem would actually take only one and a half turns to move an inch whereas this one would take three. So again, lots of different variations. So again, getting all this information correct, making sure that stem will fit in the actuator. Now, if you don't do that right, you'll end up with, with a mess. So uh, some people say, well, why don't you just cut it to the Acme standard? Um, history has shown me if you cut a stem bushing to an Acme standard, it probably won't fit. Uh, most uh, gate and valve manufacturers have their own cuts to their stems. Uh, they're a little bit, uh, not necessarily a true acme thread, 29 degree, a stub acme. So again, uh, it's always best to measure them to get them cut right. So after we uh, cut out, get our stem measurements, then we have to machine uh, the thrust bushing. The thrust bushing in our actuators is a transition piece or that we call a stem nut. It would be threaded to match that valve stem. And then when it's inserted, this case is a bevel gear, it would have thrust bearings on it that would support the thrust loads and produce the torque. Also recognizing uh, and looking at the thrust of valves is the, the loads we're dealing with. A 20 inch gate valve, a high pressure gate valve could take up to 286,000 pounds of thrust. A Pratt Whitney aircraft engine only takes only produces 63,000 pounds of thrust. So relatively considering we deal with very high forces with our actuators. So in dealing with actuation, uh, the engineering details should not be handled lightly. Because if you don't consider all the details, things can happen. Here's a scenario where we automated an existing gate valve for a customer. Uh, and they um, had, the plan was to mount the actuator to the concrete floor, and we did. We had to calculate the stem pitch and lead and do all the sizing and provide stem support so that over torquing of the hand wheel wouldn't bend the valve stem, and we did. Uh, they had a storm come through, uh, a log got ran, run through the uh, sluice gate, the gate closed, and the actuator torqued out, and when it did, it cracked the floor. The customer called and said, hey, the actuator cracked my floor. I said, well, did it torque out? Yes. Did it stop? Yes. I said, I didn't design the floor. So anyway, so, um, but again, the forces we deal with. Here's another large gate. This is a 96 inch gate valve with uh, an actuator up the top with driving a gearbox that's producing 880,000 pounds of thrust, 999,000 pounds of torque. Uh, out of this actuator with this 96 inch uh, gate valve. Again, high forces, high torques, high thrust, um, serious considerations need to be taken. Another multi turn application similar to the gate valve is the globe valve. Um, you notice in looking at the picture of this globe valve versus the uh, gate valve we saw earlier, 
on, on a lot of on most globe valves, uh, the hand wheel turns the valve stem and not the stem bushing. Because actually the most globe valve, the stem turns because the, the plug or the seat itself is designed to rotate and uh, for its seating purposes. So in this scenario, it operates kind of like a gate valve. It's what we call rising rotating. We have to rotate the stem and allow it to rise inside the actuator without using the threads in the actuator. So we have to adapt and put a, a bushing or splined bushing or a keyed bushing on the top of the valve. And then we would machine our internals of our actuator in a similar manner and you know, provide mounting pad and then mount the actuator and that stem would actually turn inside the actuator, those keys or that spline to slide up and down inside the actuator as that globe valve opens and closes. That's called a rising rotating application. That one's a little more challenging to do in the field because the, it's critical to get the mounting flange of the actuator perfectly perpendicular to that valve stem, otherwise it will bind as it rises and rotates and tries to slide in the actuator. So. But again, we, we've done this is a picture of a valve here that I, I automated in the field for, for a chemical plant and uh, first stroke through worked perfectly. So it's, it's, it's very doable. Uh, and dealing with, uh, again, gate and globes, uh, I'll show you this picture to show this is our, one of our L120 um, smaller to mid size units. But we handled the thrust in our smaller L120 electromechanical actuators with a thrust base, which is pretty common to the marketplace today. We would machine the bushing, and the bushing goes into a ductile line housing, and this housing supports the uh, uh, thrust bearings on the stem bushing, and also the bushing is machined for the valve stem. So we would machine it accordingly. You would uh, fasten the thrust base and stem that together and screw the base down on your valve, and then just set the actuator over the valve stem and bolt it to the thrust base. So it makes it a lot easier to assemble in that regard. And this is a picture of our electromechanical actuators. We have a, a, a motor set driving a spur gear here and, and worm reduction set here. So it's a double reduction gear sets. And we have a mechanical limit switch and a mechanical torque switch that work off mechanics of the worm against compression springs here for torque and the limit switch rotates off of the output drive sleeve of the actuator. So we always monitor the valve actuator, the, the valve uh, drive sleeve output from the actuator rather than the worm shaft to make sure that we're moving the valve itself. And a hand will override. So this is a very common uh, electromechanical actuator. And our larger actuators, our SMBs and our larger L120 products, um, becomes a little more difficult when you put a thrust base under an actuator to have to pull the whole actuator off to change your stem bushing. So there's some B series and our large actuators, L120, 190 and larger, are designed with a top entry stem nut. So the idea with this actuator is you would, again, bolt it to the valve. The valve stem would be true to the top of the actuator. You would thread your stem bushing down the valve stem into the actuator engage it, turn the handle, and it will suck down into the actuator. And then you put a lock nut on top. It has a, it has a retention ring in the bottom. Then you, you will be encasing that stem bushing in the actuator. In the event your stem bushing does wear, and they will, stem bushings are a wearable item on any gate application. You remove your locking ring, turn your hand wheel, and your stem bushing comes crawling out of the actuator for replacement uh, as a maintenance item. And you haven't had to determ or remove this big actuator off your valve to do so. So that's the advantage of the top entry stem nut. It's, it's really good for large valves and large actuators. We have another scenario. Um, back in the 60s, when we, when, when we started building a lot more of the large uh, fossil power plants and refineries, um, one of the issues that came up uh, with high pressure and high temperature valves when you, when you inject a, um, a ambient temperature, you know, uh, 60 degree or cooler ambient temperature stem into a thousand degree medium uh, steam service, for example, that uh, screw shaft is actually going to grow. 
uh, and, and due to thermal expansion. So what we've done with our uh, S SMB, we've put a compensating spring cover on the dry sleeve. And then when we close a large gate valve in high ambient temperatures, 450 degrees C uh, or 800 degrees F or higher, we go send this valve into a wedge seat. And then uh, if the stem does try to grow, the actuator itself will absorb that growth uh, by letting the stem bushing move up into and compress these springs. It may only move an eighth of an inch. But if you don't do that, what happens is the thermal expansion forces the valve further into the seat after it's already been torque seated. And eventually you end up with uh, damaged valve seats and valves that stick coming out of uh, closure. So again, uh, this has solved that problem in applications. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of combined cycle plants and refineries got away from this product because it is a little expensive. But many of them now are going back to putting them in because the uh, valve damage resulting from not protecting against thermal expansion is pretty expensive. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's the uh, gates and globes. Water turn valves, uh, likewise, we have to have critical information. It's, it's pretty important to know the, the valve size, the pitch, I mean, the valve size, the uh, pressures, the valve stem diameters, uh, the mounting flanges, uh, and then the valve torque requirements. That's information we get from the manufacturers or it's calculated based on a process. And then we size the actuator accordingly based on that required torque. Generally on larger, uh, say 10 inches and larger, we will uh, use a worm gear box and drive a multi-turn actuator driving it. Uh, all of our quarter turn actuators have mechanical stops so that you, you, know, you can set them at the open and closed travels. And they're designed to prevent over travel of the valve by use of the hand wheel. Uh, mechanical stops are never designed to run the valve into them in a torque scenario. They're always designed just for manual operation to prevent over travel. Likewise, we have for smaller valves, we have our uh, QX series products and our LTQ series that are designed for small valves, maybe up to um, maybe up to 24 inch low pressure butterfly valves, for example. We can drive with a direct mount quarter turn actuator with no additional gearbox. It's designed to go 90 degrees uh, with a very much more compact uh, design. So a little less complicated than a gate valve, but again, uh, knowing the torques and the stem diameters and things to properly size it is still very critical. Here's a picture of a larger product. This really is a multi-turn application, but a scenario, scenario for hydro dam where we have painter gates and basically a tanner gate is a, a large gate on a hydro or, or, or a power plant where they're actually using uh, cables and winches to, to raise and lower large gates. This actually is a multi-turn worm gear box and then a large actuator driving it. This valve may take 30,000 pounds of torque to open and close and it may take 30 minutes to an hour to cycle it. Again, we accommodate that with special duty motors and actuators accordingly, but again, Another example of a torque application using a uh, multi-turn actuator and a gearbox, pretty common. Seating methods. <clears throat> In uh, 1929, this guy named Payne Dean designed the first valve actuator. We know in history, they called it a limitor. The, the key feature he designed in 1929 was the ability to sense torque from the actuator, as well as sense and monitor valve position. Those principles have maintained the same today, and matter of fact, the very processes are almost identical that we'll be using some electromechanicals today. So, so every actuator has the ability to uh, sense and close a valve based on torque, or and also sense and shut off uh, contacts based on positions. A torque switch on our electromechanical products based work off of, off of a uh, compression spring design, basically movement of our worm shaft against uh, Belleville spring washers is a measurable amount of force and we activate the torque switch on that mechanical principle. We won't get into that today. If you want to know that, we can do that on a future uh, training session. But again, torque seating 
allows the actuator to close the valve at a preset force on the valve seat every time. A scenario where you would torque seat would be, for example, a wedge gate. If you look at a wedge gate, it is wedged in design. Uh, every time you close a wedge gate, those wedges and seats rub, uh, and there's wear associated with that rubbing. As that valve ages and closed over time, that valve closure point will change. Uh, it may take 25 turns today and 25 and a half next year for the same valve to seal without leaking by. So in 1929, Payne Dean invented Lumatorque and he invented a torque switch device that basically would shut the actual the valve off at a certain output force against the seats. Whether it takes 25 turns or 27 turns, the actuator doesn't care. The motor won't shut off until it produces a certain amount of force or sees a certain amount of resistance against the valve seats. We would still use our limit switch to turn off uh, the open and closed lights and give indications, hey, we're pretty close to being closed. Uh, maybe we use a limit switch for the open side. Maybe we actually torque it open and close. We, we can do both. But then other valves like soft seated butterfly valves, double disc gate valves, uh, are often sort of position seated, which means if you turn a ball valve 90 degrees, the valve is designed to seal itself. We don't seal the valve. We're just agile to turn the valve stem 90 degrees or a parallel seat gate valve. Our job is to turn the valve stem 27 turns. At that point, the valve is supposed to seal itself. Applying force to the valve doesn't necessarily uh, change the seating location. So again, that's considered position seating, and that should be determined by the valve manufacturer as to how the valves are seated on position or torque. But again, our limit switches historically have been a mechanical device using an odometer gear principle that once you set them, they're set for life. And we've got actuators uh, with the odometer gear principle that have been running for over 50 years and never been adjusted and 100% repeatable. So again, uh, this is where we use our limit switch. We always have a limit switch in train with the torque seating. We always have a torque switch in train with the position seating. And torque switch becomes a backup for an obstruction or anything that would cause the actuator to exceed a torque setting uh, when it's when it's stroked. So we talked about two types of valves, and we talked a little bit about you know, this type of actuator we call electromechanical. Limitorx still makes electromechanical actuators. We have a lot of customers that still want um, basic mechanics driving their actuation rather than electronics. Our L120 and our SMB. Uh, all the examples of those products. And again, as I said earlier, we have motor driving a gear train, uh, which turns the output to the actuator to the valve, likewise, same here. And then we have mechanical switches that are gear driven that actually activate and make and break mechanical contacts, to give indication of valve open and close or uh, movement and compression of springs, activate a torque sensing switch. When it opens up, it actually shuts off on torque. So again, it's mechanically activated switches and we can put reversing controls, network controls, analog controls, various types of control wiring in the actuators and do all the control scenarios you wanna do. We work, we have a scenario where we use, main, use a critical service application with redundant wiring in the actuators so we actually have SMBs with PLCs running them um, for multi-port type valves. So again, any scenario you want to do, these are all hardwired, custom wired, custom built actuators as, as needed. The good thing with electromechanical actuator is really is there isn't a lot of maintenance to them. Um, the main thing you have to do is check the lubricant every couple of years, make sure it's moist and not hardened or dried from heat. Uh, make sure there's no water intrusion. If it is, you need to degrease them and put in fresh grease. Uh, if there's any leakage around seals, you need to replace the seal, but it's really pretty uncommon. Um, check the stem nuts if they wear on gate valves. Um, basically, there's no need to go in the cover unless you need to go in and adjust the limit switch or torque switch, uh, but it's pretty, pretty rare. 
But generally, the best thing you do is just <clears throat> run them unless you have an indication or a warning that there's an issue. <coughs> Excuse me. So we have lots of different wiring options on the actuators. Um, this scenario, we have a you know, just a common configuration of a wiring diagram. And the wiring is all controlled, control wiring to basically engage in motor contact. Someone has to control that, whether it's in our actuator or in the uh, control room of the plant. Reversing contactors is what engages the motor to go open or close as required based on the requirements of the controls. And then the control power in the actuator opens or closes the circuit to this device to uh, engage or disengage uh, the motor. Every actuator has as a standard, a uh, limit switch, a torque switch, a compartment heater, and a terminal strip. Everything beyond that becomes uh, an option. And there are lots of options available uh, in most actuators. One thing I know is actuator motors are different than a pump or a compressor or a blower type motor. Generally, our motors are limited duty design. Uh, actuators cycle for 15 seconds, 15 minutes, or whatever they're based on the valve cycle requirement times all, but not made to run 24 hours a day constantly. So they're limited duty motors. Um, we can provide continuous duty motors if needed. Uh, we have AC motors generally, three phase and single phase power. We have some options for DC motors. We also have an option for an air motor. We actually use a 100 PSI rotary air motor, kind of like kind of like a uh, air drill, if you think about it, uh, that runs the uh, the mechanics of the actuator with uh, solenoid or popper controlled um, limits and torque switches. We have a lot of chemical plants that will use these in compact areas where the, there's not enough room for a cylinder to operate about. The other scenario or type of um, actuator is the electronic or what we call non-intrusive actuators. Generally, these actuators are all IP68 seals, enclosures, weatherproof and explosion-proof service, and they allow all configuration and setup to be done without removing of any covers exposing the electronics to the atmosphere. So. In 1989, we introduced our first uh, intelligent or non-intrusive actuator. We call it the MX series. Um, our MX series was the first actuator in the marketplace. So rather than using remotes, one of the competitors uses handheld remotes like you would use on your TV to configure the actuator. We put the configuration and control on the actuator's base. So you can go into and use this controls to open and close the valve locally, put it in local remote, or you can use a scenario of configuring these, shaking the, moving these knobs, and it'll actually go into a setup mode and you begin answering yes, no questions to set the actuator up and configure it. If you wanna use a Bluetooth or IRD uh, tool, we have those available, but again, it doesn't require a remote uh, to, to configure it up. Some people say, well, hey, I don't want someone in the field going in and measuring or changing my actuator. Um, that's totally controlled by the plant. Uh, there is passcode protection to get into a configuration, but we have the ability to, with a user input from the control room, a, a contact closure, you can disable the functionality of these knobs until you give it back from the control room. Or you can say, hey, I only want the use, I only want the stop function to work. I want nothing else to work. It's a user configurable input to the actuator. So we have total control of the actuator's local operation from the control room, uh, if you want. The one thing with electronics is it never stays the same. Um, I used to like my first uh, mobile phone. It was a bag phone. Anybody still use a bag phone? Uh, I don't think so. I used to like my Blackberry. Can't get my Blackberry anymore. The thing with electronics is, and electronic actuators is, components are only generally a seven to 10 year life. 
processors and, and chips and things that we used in 1990 are no longer available. Uh, the same thing happens with other electronics uh, and other actuator products. The one unique aspect of that limit talk is taken into consideration is consistency in design. Um, uh, a lot of competitors, as their products have changed and obsoleted because of non-availability non components, have designed new products that, to offer as replacements. What Limitalk is taking the position is, well, rather than replace the actuator, which you can do if you need to, why not give the customer the op option to just upgrade his old actuator to the present controls? And that's what we've done. So basically, every MX actuator from 1989, the first one's built to today, we can change the display cover and change the, uh, the uh, main board, and the mechanics of the actuator hasn't changed. Um, that's not true with any of our competitors, and I think it's a unique advantage, and I think our customers appreciate this. So as our electronics and controls do obsolete, we give you the option. We can upgrade it, replace it with a new board. If you want a new actuator, we can provide you a new actuator. It's, it's your choice. We're not forcing you one way or the other. So with electronics actuators, it becomes a lot more user-friendly. On our L120s and SMBs, to sell a limit switch, you have to open a cover and turn a screw or, or a drill a thousand turns. And if you turn it the wrong way, guess what? You got to turn it again another thousand turns. So if you're not used to setting them up, it can be complicated and confusing. The MX, our QX is electronic actuators, very simple to set up. You go into a setup menu, and uh, now with our MXB, you have a little, a little toggle knob here. You scroll through your menu, you say, okay, I want to set my limits. Okay, it says, is the valve closed? You say no. You put it in local and you close the valve or you close it by hand, whichever way you want to do. Is the valve closed? Yes. Okay, is the valve open? You run the valve open. You say yes. You just set your open and close limits. You also calibrate your positioner, calibrate your output, calibrate your torque curve, um, everything by setting that open and close limit switch. You can set your torque switch. You can set your torque switch up or down in 1% increments. You also can go into a levels of diagnostics. Do you want to know the operating speed of your actuator to your valve for the last 10 cycles to see if there are any deviations? Would you like to know if the valve took three seconds longer to close over the last two years? Uh, we have uh, timestamp um, uh, watchdog timers on the actuator. We date stamp every functionality, every function of the actuator. Would you do you want to know if a truck backed into it yesterday when they dump in cement? Because we can tell you if the actuator had a shock or a vibration movement, we'll tell you the time of day it happened. So again, diagnostic used to be going to see if my grease in my actuator was good, and that was about all you did. But today with the electronic actuators, you can get your open and close indication. I can tell you that the, someone's moving the valve by hand by providing a contact closure to the control room. Most any configuration or function you can think of, we can tell you. And also, we got to have the diagnostics if you want to go into it to look at uh, thousands of variations of data, historically dated, uh, on your valve and actuator. So it takes diagnostics to a whole new menu and whole new uh, concept. We actually also provide you warnings. Uh, if you have the encoders we use in our actuators are, are absolute. Um, and they're based on an optical encoder device. We have a series of, um, uh, of, of gears that rotate. As those gears rotate, there are these little slots in those gears. And we're shooting optical transmitters and receivers on both sides of the board. And as the uh, gears move, it takes 10,000 turns of the actuator for the final gear back here to make one revolution. So as all these gears are moving, we're picking up that light signature uh, and that tells us where the actuator uh, is in its, in its travel. So it's, a, so it's an absolute encoder. We don't require batteries or maintenance maintain power sources to the actuator because we're not remembering how many turns it took of something for the valve to close. We are reading true data uh, and we've stored the information 
in the actuator's um, memory of what the light signature is for open and what the light signature is for close. So it knows everything in between and what position the valve is in. So it's a totally absolute encoder, no power required. You can move the actuator by hand, move it by motor, wake it up. It's gonna know exactly where it is every time. Um, we also added, added the IP68, a uh, 50 foot submerged seven day sealed enclosure with the MX. Uh, another feature, those of you who like me have done a little service work over the years. In our older days with the SMBs and L120s, if you change a motor, you usually, it usually ended up pretty greasy. Uh, the MX product, we sealed the motor from the gearbox so you could actually remove three cap screws, unplug the motor, plug a new motor back in, and you haven't lost a drip of lubricant. The lubricants changed. We, we used to use grease. We now use a, a synthetic lubricant in our MX and QX products. Uh, it's, it's good for um, a, a million dry sleeve turns. Uh, if you do have moisture or something in your lubricant, you like you do your lawnmower, you take the plug, drain it out, and put in fresh. Uh, so again, very easy to service and maintain. And again, we've been producing the same mechanical actuator since 1989, and we are on our third generations of electronics. Uh, but again, everything's backwards compatible. So good, good product, intelligent product, lots and lots of features, functionality available. We also have a quarter turn product we call the QX. It also adapts to a linear base for control map application, but much like the MX, it uses uh, non-intrusive configuration. It actually uses a brushless DC motor that can be powered with single phase or three phase or DC power uh, to control your valve, change speed of operation. It's all programmable in the actuator. Um, modulating applications, it's a great modulating actuator. Uh, our MXs are rated up to 1200 starts per hour for modulating. Our QX is actually rated 1800 starts per hour per IEC uh, standards. Again, a great throttling, high accuracy actuator for control valves as well as um, any other valve. I won't take you through all these, but basically uh, our MX QX products, as I said earlier, allow configuration from the display or it can be done with the handheld tool Basically, you have a PDA, or now with our new MXB, it's smartphone compatible. We have apps uh, coming out first end of this year. You can go through a configuration screen and select what you want to do. Uh, you can change the valve setup. You can set the position, uh, calibrate the analog controls. Everything is done from the display or through your handheld uh, module. Again, in the earlier products, we could tell you the valve open or close in the SMB and L120s in the MX. We can configure relays to give contact closures, contact open, contact closed, or even a blinking contact to the control room on the occurrence of valve open, valve close. If you're in mid travel, someone's moving the valve by hand. If, if you over torque to so any one of these scenarios, if you want to know, we can give you up to eight contact closures to the control room as an indicator. Of course, if you're using digital network controls, all this information is available to you over digital network. We also in the MX and QX include a monitor relay, a standard. So basically anything that would prevent the actuator from operating in remote, which could be loss of power, could be a uh, blown fuse, could be the valve torqued out, could be someone left it and stopped at the local control of the actuator. Anything that will prevent the actuator from operating in remote mode will be signaled to the monitor relay as an alarm to the control room. If you wanna know what it is, we would probably use one of these contacts, but just to know that it's not available, the monitor relay will tell you that. The uh, MX and QX are very easily adaptable to controls, hardwired, any scenario, two wire, three wire, four wire. So basically uh, two wires, signal present, the valve opens, signal absent, the valve closes. Three wires means basically you have a common and an open and a closed command. 
four wire injects a stop. So you have a stop command, open and a close command. Again, we have options for analog control, 420 control, high accuracy, and then network controls. We support field bus, profi bus, uh, DP and PA, and new RITCOM, uh, Modbus, DeviceNet, HART, TCP IP Ethernet, uh, and we're hopefully to have uh, Rockwell IP Ethernet uh, in the near future. Sometimes you can't reach the actuator if you want to open and close it in the field. So we have a remote mounted push button station, very simple, open and close. And this can be wired to the actuator for uh, local operation as somewhere on a catwalk that's not accessible to the actuator. Um, sometimes people want to know if the actuator is open and close or power the display. Some of our competitors use a battery in their actuator, which will wear out. We have what we call our quick module. We have a super capacitor module we can put in the MX and QX. On loss of primary power, super capacitor will power the display and other information on the actuator while it's in a non-power state, probably up to a day or thereabouts. In that amount of time, if you don't know what you need, what the valve status, you probably will have powered back up. When you power back up, the, the, the capacitor is recharged for the next cycle. So Rather than having a battery you have to replace as chargeable and rechargeable um, supercapacitor modules. I showed you a simple wiring diagram earlier. <clears throat> Again, lots and lots of control options with the MX and QX built in as standard. We can add option cards to them. And basically, most any scenario you want to do. Again, hardwired, analog, network control. Um, customer input power control, local power control, um, ESD scenarios, inhibits, hey, this valve can't close until that valve, it's all done within the standard actuator with the wiring and configuration. One of the last things we need to make sure we do is make sure the actuator we apply fits the requirements of, of the certifications required for the plant. So we offer products in every common configuration and enclosure certification. We have FM and CSA. Uh, we have Cinelac, FM, ATEX, CSA, SAA, most any uh, international or North American standard for actuation considerations, we are certified to with our MX and QX product. Uh, our L120 and SMB are also FM and CSA certified, which I know is important to you all, uh, and as are they are as they are to some other some other standards. But the MX and QX meet all the known standard industry requirements. The last thing I'll leave you with is you never know to, never know when your actuator will be needed to save the world, or also when it will look good in the movie. A uh, new movie coming out recently and uh, pretty cool. We got a couple of screenshots from the movie. Um, uh, got a couple of actuators in the background that look pretty sweet. So we're kind of proud of that. Uh, today's talk was mainly about electric actuators. Uh, Limitorx produces a, a whole series of pneumatic actuators we call our LPS series. They're produced out of Italy. It was, it was a ground up development plant flow serve introduced back uh, about five years ago, uh, building high quality Scotch yoke actuators, uh, large and small. I'll hand it back over. Brayden, you can take it. All right, perfect. Thank you. Thank you, uh, David. So um, uh, just a conclusion. So uh, some common issues found in Actuation servicing uh, over under torque output. We talked about uh, drive bushing failures. Uh, we really wanted to look at uh, how do we achieve maximum lifespan from existing actuators. You know, proper size. We, we just we talked about regular maintenance is uh, is key. Um, and then when it comes to understanding replacement requirements, um, really making sure that uh, uh, we've got a good uh, uh, good information on the valve top works information and measurements and uh, valve torque data. Um, so all all this uh, CGIS and, uh, uh, and limit torque uh, can definitely help with our service. 
this team is uh, well trained on on uh, gathering this information. So uh, we could either help you over the phone or ideally in in uh, in plant in uh, in the field. We can come out and uh, help you with those measurements. Uh, all right, next slide. I think. Uh, that is it. So uh, thank you so much, everyone, for uh, uh, the hour today. We'll uh, we'll jump. We did have some nice questions that came through during the presentation. Um, so we'll jump into those shortly here. But uh, first of all, big thanks to uh, David Williams. Appreciate uh, you sharing your knowledge and information. Obviously, you have a wealth of it. Uh, and Rob, thank you as well for uh, um, your time and putting this together. Uh, so let's jump into a few questions here that we came. So uh, first one here is, um, um, how about TUV uh, certification for SIL rated ESD applications? David, do you wanna yes. speak to that? Uh, uh, we do have our MX product is SIL 3 certified. For SIL 3 requires redundant actuation. Yes, we are SIL 3 certified with our MX product. Perfect, all right. Good question. Um, we talked about the voltages early on, um, 460 volt three phase, is that uh, something? That yeah, that's, that's our standard. Uh, today actually, we're seeing a lot more 480 volt than we are 460, but we actually have both 460 and 480 volt motors. The, in reality, they're normally you know interchangeable, but since we're seeing more 480 volt applications, we're actually moving to 480 volt motors. You know, our motors are rated for plus or minus 10% voltage. But when you already have 480 volt power, even though you're using a 460 volt motor, that 10% higher gets up into the 500 volt range. So again, for that reason, as we see in power voltages go higher, we're actually starting to move into standardized on 480 volt motors as our standard and still have 460 and use them for 460 or if someone wants a true, a true 460 motor, we have them available. Perfect. Um, just uh, quickly before we go into the next question here, I know it's, uh, it's past the hour now, so we'll stay on and answer all the questions that come in. Uh, if you do have to run, we respect uh, everybody's time is uh, precious. And uh, so uh, there is a recording available. So Sam will send that out as long with, along with a couple of other um, pieces of collateral uh, for all those who signed up. Um, but uh, please stay. Uh, throw your questions in the Q&A. Uh, but if you do have to run, uh, please be aware that we will... Uh, um, we will be providing this information as well. Uh, and like I said, uh, there's a question, there's um, on the screen right now, there's uh, David's and Rob's uh, email address. So if you have any questions you wanna reach out to them directly, please feel free to do that. Uh, all right, so next question that came in. Um, on the quarter turn actuator, how many degrees do you, can you actually get out of the, the actuators? Uh, obviously 90 degrees is normal, but uh, is there more or less than? Yeah, so our, our standard quarter turn actuator is 90 degrees plus or minus five degrees on each inner travel. So actually that's, you know, 100 degrees of full rotation potentially. Some will actually do more. Some will do 120. Our QX unit, um, the standard QX unit will do probably 130. But again, it varies based on the product, but the minimum anything we sell is plus or minus is 100 degrees full span of movement. But we also offer options for a multi-turn worm box that you can do 270 or you can do 360s with if needed. Right. Um, another one with regards to fire equipment compliance uh, for safety shutoff valve actuators, uh, any, and, um, do we have CSA B149.3? So we are, um, and I don't know all my fire safety standards. We we are um, we use uh, FR or um, I'm drawing a blanket. What's the other fireproofing um, thermal design? So we offer thermal design or or FR box shells for actuators, and we are fully you know, two thousand degree fire certified actuators. K -mass, thermal, I think was, yeah, K mass, right? Thermal design is K mass. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. It was originally introduced by thermal design, but it is called K mass, correct? Perfect. Okay. Thanks, Darren, for <laughs> heads up there. Uh, right. Um, there was uh, a couple of ones here coming in for. Um, so for applications using a knife gate valve where we can encounter scale buildup. Um, 
how do you decide on setting the limits on torque or stroke uh, or position? Um, is it based on thickness of scale, hardness of scale, anything like that? Um, again, as far as whether the valve is seated on torque or position, uh, for me, that would normally be a valve manufacturer criteria. Okay. If you're worried about scale buildup on the valve and it, you know, causing the valve to have seat issues, um, I don't know. I, I guess I'm not an expert on uh, scaled valves, but yeah. you could do it either way. I mean, if you if you're concerned about uh, the torque changing on the valve due to scale and buildup, again, it's a good example of where, like on the MXB, you can monitor the valve torque increase and compensate for it with you know, adjusting it over the system or, you know, knowing, hey, it's time to go in and PM that valve. Which that's a nice feature with the MXB and even the MXA had diagnostics in there to monitor torque to the valve and historically trend it and use that data to know when it's time to PM the valve. All right. All right. Thank you. Um, you mentioned, I think, earlier on that there was a difference between motorized gears versus manual gear operators. Is is there what's the differences? What are the keys um, for? A hand wheel or push a button. So basically, uh, we have uh, bevel gear boxes and worm gear boxes that we utilize for, for both purposes. Now, again, it's, it's relative to the ratios. So we have different ratios available. For example, if I was operating a 72 inch uh, knife gate, for example, I probably would use a different ratio for a hand wheel than I would for a motor operator. Okay, I would drive it with a big motor operator with, to, to handle the lesser turns, but I want 80 pound rim pull with a hand wheel, I probably would need a, you know, 70, 70 to one overall ratio, where I would use a six to one ratio with my electric. So again, we have different ratios of gearboxes available from hand wheel versus motor, but the basic gearbox itself, the output drive sleeve, the worm gear, the housing, it's all the same. The only difference is the ratio and do you push a button or do you turn a wheel? Good, good. I think that is all the questions that have come in. So um, we will uh, we'll end it there, like I said uh, before. So thank you everyone for uh, your participation. Uh, again, David Williams, big thank you for uh, uh, joining us today. Rob, thanks for putting this on. And um, all everybody stay safe. And uh, if there's any other questions, please feel free to reach out to Rob Cooper directly or David Williams and uh, Hopefully answer more questions and uh, we will see you hopefully on the next uh, webinar. Thank you everyone.